it's Coach MK. Sorry for the funny light and sound. I have a very not feeling good baby sleeping downstairs and um, but the cleaning lady's coming in a few hours to take care of the mess that uh, the virus from hell has wrought on my household because <laughs> well, everybody was vomiting last night. So, except me, thank God. But all I just say, while I've got a little time, I was cleaning out my email and um, my general rule of thumb is when I see more than five questions on the same topic, um, it's probably worth discussing this topic with you in this format. So, um, I first of all, back up a little bit, I appreciate all the email. You can always email your questions to info at coachandlove.com. I promise I will respond, but my responses will almost never be written because this is easier, more convenient, and more accurate for me. Because writing an answer, knowing how important these answers are to you, um, I would rather perform them where you can hear my voice and the inflection and the tone and you know for sure when I'm being sarcastic versus when you read something, if you can't hear my voice reading it to you, then I have failed you in some way or I might increase rather than decrease your anxiety about whatever it was you caused you to reach out in the first place. And that is the opposite of what I want. It's part of being coached and loved. So get ready for a quick, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend, there's just not a whole lot to say about this. Um, but so I just want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a training plan because I've been getting a lot of questions about what to look for in a training plan, what elements matter. And the, uh, one of the things I learned in grad school that was hammered into me when I was writing my thesis um, was the question begets the answer. While we spent more time formulating good questions for my research than we did answering them because again, the question begets the answer. So when I get a question that is very loaded, full of assumptions and very leading, one of the first things I'll say is let's unpack this or let's break this down. Okay. So the question that I, the questions that I had been getting that were fairly loaded, um, were about which elements of a training plan were the most important. And that, in my opinion, is a loaded question and the wrong question, because then that gives you permission to seek out an element, um, or judge training plans based on the presence of an element that might not be the right element for you or the right one that you're looking at. So, um, I'm not, oh, hello. Hello, I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Karen. Thank you for joining. Um, so without, without, without further ado, I just want to talk about all training plans are basically the same. All of us um, that, that coach have gone to the same certifications. What makes us different is, number one, our passion and enthusiasm for um, the training itself um, and our ability to do that well and connect with our athletes. Because the, 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 the great paradox of coaching is that the sort of person that is uh, uh, driven to hire a coach is a bit of an overachiever and overachievers don't like not having the answer and they don't like hearing this conclusion you've drawn is incorrect. Um, so you're by doing my job well, I'm automatically repelling my client base and that's a tough thing to, to, to do and it's a very tough thing to navigate carefully. So. All training plans, all of us are really working from the same playbook. It's the, it's the cues we give, the concern we give, and the conversations that we're willing to have really that separate us. And most coaches are totally happy to get stuck in this pink space right here that I'm going to talk about. And you guys are too. You lead them there, you lock them in, and you won't let them out because this is the part that is usually generally referred to as the speed phase. And all you want to talk about is the speed work. I want the science -y science and the data e data to get the best -y best -y best -y best speed work for special, special me. Because I only need the most accurate, perfecto speed work that ever was. And if you don't have the science, I'm not going to get the results. And I'm like, whoa, that is wrong. First of all, there's no magic workout. This is the least important phase least important phase okay but we'll get to that so what I, this is where you guys want to play and this part typically with my clients makes them very angry i don't need 12 weeks of base building yes you do and here's why see that oh hello i'm so sorry i interrupted your bosu but this is a very important announcement that i'm going to start making and good for you for humble bragging on the BOSU to the coach on the live stream that makes you teacher's pet. Congratulations, Kim. Yay. So all training plans, generally speaking, have, well, three parts. I look at it as four, but that's a personal thing. 
Okay, so the first part is the base phase, the second part is the speed phase, and then the final part is like, the ra they call it just the race preparation phase or the racing phase. And I break that into two pieces, right? Because it's like, as we go less critical, less critical, everything becomes more critical the closer we get to race day, which does not mean these workouts are the most important, but it means if you haven't been doing the work here, you ain't getting the results in here, right? Because it's too late. By the time we've crossed out of the base phase, there's no making up anything. There are no changes that you can make. The best you can do is really start taking the extra seriously because we are already up the ante in some way. We got no wiggle room. We can't ramp. We can't start making up runs because we're already maxing out your mileage. We can't start adding more speed elements because we're maxing out your mileage. If you have not been on this slow gradual increase where we then sort of flatline and increase in intensity, you can't come on that intensity ride and expect to get the benefits from it if you haven't been in the base building phase. So, but usually, and I, and I say this again lovingly, my base phase is four weeks longer. Ideally, it would be eight weeks longer. I really like 24 week training plans. I mean, honestly, I do. Um, if I'm getting someone from scratch, what most of my clients that I've trained one-on-one -on -one for, for the better part of four years, what they do is very similar to, it's going to be, I'm going to call it the fitness protection program when I roll it out. And the fitness protection program is how they train and how they train is how I train. And I have a very high base that goes year round. And I have a 24 week training plan for a race that I care about so I can have an extra long speed phase, right? Because my base building never stops. If you were to think of it this way, my, um, my base phase is like out of a 52 week year, my base phase is probably 30 weeks. Crazy, right? So I've got 30 weeks of prep of getting ready for my training, for my training cycle. During that training cycle, I might have a longer speed phase. And that gives me more wiggle room because I've got 30 weeks to balance it out. I can go instead of four weeks, I can have eight. I can have eight weeks and I can try different things and I can play with different things and I can go do a tune-up race and recover. And that's not something you guys give me because you're like, you're ticking clock because time is money and I'm not spending a dime more on this than I have to. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I get it. Money's a thing for sure. There was a long time when we were paycheck to paycheck and I'm sensitive to that because it's, it's close enough in the rear view mirror that I haven't forgotten it. At the same time, though, you're, you get what you pay for. You could do this on your own. If you haven't, though, maybe it's time to think about what we could be doing differently or wrong. But I digress. So my personal base billing phase goes year-round. More often than not, when people come to me for an event, like all of you that accidentally won the New York City Marathon Lottery and have said to me, when do I need to start preparing? And I'm like, well, you need to start running now. Like now. Because the training, the base phase of the training is going to start in eight weeks. So let's go ahead and just get into the habit now so this won't be a shock to your system and a total overload later. Enjoy the base phase. Be careful what you wish for. That's so true. Susan, you can get that right. Because um, Susan and everyone doing three days at the fair is kind of living what I do because they were doing a base phase. Their base phase really started back in November and their speed phase is, is egregiously long. It's about, it's um, nine weeks. No, so it's almost, it's a little bit longer than my speed phase when I'm going for performance on a road um, in a year when I'm really fit. That's where three days at the fair is at right now. But I digress. So not to get too far away from this. Hi, Lisa. Sorry, I'm streaming. I'll You're be good. out of here in a few minutes. You're fine. Um, I'll be quiet. Yeah, the baby's sleeping, so. Oh, poor, bless her heart. She had a um, really bad virus and was vomiting a lot yesterday. So uh, we've had a couple loads of laundry going this morning. RJ vomited too. Um, yeah, so yay, it smells great downstairs. It's <laughs> our cleaning lady. God bless her. I love her so much. Um, but okay, so generally speaking, what we want to get as a co coach's perspective, what I want you, my clients, to get out of the base phase is number one, they're coming, to, I'm assuming most of the reason, and this is another reason why my training plans are so long, so much longer than everybody else's. It's not just that, your mom's, and I know you're going to need the leeway. But what we're trying to do in the base phase, I'm assuming you're, you're going to come to me and you're going to say, like, I got into New York and, and I'm, I've been running for 10 years and I weigh 156 pounds, but, you know, I, my, my happy place is really 145 and I'm working on that. And, 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 and,
is that you've not been running and all that other stuff that you do tell me doesn't matter and I don't care about it at all. I don't care. If you're here, we got work to do. If you've already signed up for the race, we've, we've got work to do. And I don't want to talk about what you have or have not been doing and I don't want to play. I want to work. So the work starts with getting back into the running pattern, making running part of your lifestyle, making training part of your lifestyle, making training not optional because that's the hard part. People come in and they want the training plan to fit into the crevices in the corners of their life and I get it because we're moms, but guess what? If you are going to talk about, well, I need to get my money's worth out of this training cycle and you better work coach, I'm like, well, you got to do the runs. This ain't about me working. This is about you making space for this thing that you signed up to do. All training plans work. Most coaches are smarter than me. Most coaches you'll meet are more experienced than I am. What they won't do, what makes this different, is that I'm willing to entertain this conversation where other coaches won't. They want to talk about the speed work. They want to talk about the running. And I get that it's not about the running. And I will give you strategies on negotiating this with your spouse if you haven't been so bold as to ask for anything before. I will discuss how to balance this with your children. What I will not do is say, you can do half the work and get all the results because it's, it's, I mean, it's fine. No one cares, but you care. You care. And if you do half the work, you're going to feel bad. And if you cross that finish line knowing you could have done more, you're going to feel bad and you're going to feel guilty and you're going to feel torn. And as moms, don't we have enough of that? I have enough of that. I felt torn yesterday when I needed to go take a three hour nap because I had not slept more than 45 minutes at a stretch in the previous two nights. And when I got home from the hospital with the baby, I collapsed and I cried when I woke up because I'm like, that's three hours. I was paying someone else, not just to hold my sick baby, but my older kids hadn't seen me. You know, Wednesday nights are our pizza night. It's our, it's our slumber party night. And I felt terrible. Like I had three hours. I I'll get a short period with my older kids every day. And I spent mine taking a nap Well, I needed that nap. For one, so I shouldn't have felt guilty, but you know, it's we're you are always going to feel torn. You are always going to feel like maybe I should, and that's why I say it's shaming to live in the should do, right? Let's talk about this and frame it from the gonna do, gotta do. We got to get back into the pattern, the running lifestyle. We've got to get back into the habit of getting out of bed and going for a run, of packing the bag the night before to make sure we've laid out our outfit and everything we need to go for that run is in the kitchen. Is so for me, it's on the. Um, it's on the bathroom floor so that when I stumble out of bed at a quarter, a quarter to six, when I'm fit, I'm not, I didn't do it this morning because I was tired, but when I'm fit and there's not ice outside and I know I'm going to be able to run outdoors, I need to be able to roll into the bathroom, get dressed and sneak out the door the second the sitter walks in at six, at 6 a.m. So that is part of the lifestyle and maybe, and it also means I have to prepare my breakfast ahead of time because when I come back and I shower and I change clothes, it is time maybe because the kids are going to be under my feet. And so the, the whole showering and changing clothes thing and drying off is going to be exceptionally in, inefficient. So when we get out the door, I got to have breakfast ready to go, grab and eat while I drive them to school. Otherwise, I might not get breakfast at all. And that's not healthy. So there's a lot of planning that goes into the lifestyle that's not huge amounts of it, but it comes instinctual. Can't do this. Got, oh, no, got to get breakfast. Oh, no, set that out. I'm about to go to bed. Oh, no, I didn't put my clothes out. Going to grab my clothes very quickly. None of this is a huge time suck. It's just getting into the pattern of remembering to do it. And that's the harder part. Um, during this 12-week period, it, when we talk about increasing fitness, that tends to rub against the egos a lot of my runners, too, because they're like, I'm fit. She thinks I'm fat. She thinks I'm fat and worthless and ugly. She doesn't think I'm a runner. She just said that she thinks I don't look like a runner. Like, you guys run down a rabbit hole and don't give me a chance to, like, grab your hand and pull you back out. And it's unfair to me, and it's really unfair to you because I have not. If you've been around me for any period, you know that I have not and would not ever say any of those things in your head. I just won't. I don't even think that way. Um, what I care about is this aerobic cleanup. So what I mean by that is you've heard me say before that your cardiovascular system is kind of like a highway. It takes a long time to build it. If you don't use it, it gets dirty. But cleaning it up to make it ready for public use again is a hell of a lot faster and more efficient than trying to build it from scratch. So that's what I think of about cleanup. During this 12 weeks, let's say you have been a runner at some point, and this is not your first rodeo. Great, we wanna get those adaptations back. Think of this as 12 weeks of cleaning the highway, developing the patterns so that things get hard, hard on your body, the intensity goes up, you are on autopilot. So it's 12 weeks to get ready for autopilot. And I know really, realistically, with my lifestyle and four kids, I need about 20 weeks to get before I can go on autopilot for one, much less four. Because these are hard weeks, right Susan? <laughs> And we haven't even gotten to your final push yet. Yours is the worst. So, 
Yeah. Well, the base phase for half the in between half marathons, that was why I invented the monthly plan. And that is what the fitness protection program is going to look like. It's just going to be month to month to month. And then when you're ready to race, it'll only take us, if you really want to race a half marathon for, for performance, I can get you ready, ramped up for that in four weeks. Realistically, I can get you ramped up and tapered and ready to, for a really respectable half marathon. For a marathon, I can get you ramped and tapered in about eight. If you keep your base where I want it to be, which is where I, I would expect it to be on the monthlies in between training cycles, um, then yeah, we would need less time. It would cost less money through the year and you'd get better results. But I can never convince anyone of that. You, you guys look at everything in a vacuum. This to this to this. This number is smaller than this number and you won't trick me, Coach MK. And I'm like, fine. And I just stopped having this argument. So I'm gonna present it all differently on my website when I'm ready to start coaching again. But between now and then, um, I've never tried to cheat anyone out of money. I had gigantic $5,000 a month student loans between me and my husband for six years of our marriage. I've never forgotten what that felt like because you can't dispose of them in bankruptcy. So paying all of those off was like the equivalent of me getting $150,000 per year job. That's how much it freed up, how much cash it freed up in our house, right? Five thousand dollars over twelve years. It's over over twelve months. That's six sixty thousand dollars, right? Sixty thousand dollars after taxes in our tax bracket is almost a hundred between one hundred twenty and one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So it was a huge, huge budget reliever. I've never forgotten what those years felt like, and I'm not here trying to squeeze anyone, right? If anything, I want to scale it. I want to make it sustainable. I want you to feel comfortable coaching yourselves. I want you to know what I would do at every turn, and I want you to hear my voice in the back of your head every day. You wake up and you're like, I don't know if I'm fit enough to do this, and I'm like, yes, you are, right? That is what I want, and I've always wanted to keep that at a price point that's affordable and scalable. Right. But, you know, if, if price is the only thing you guys want to think about, then I can't have any other conversation with anyone because every training plan I've ever given out has been act arguably underpriced, especially for what I put into it. So <laughs> I get so competitive when I side up and then partway through I weigh and then it's like three weeks out and then I'm like, Christ, yeah, everyone does. But that's why I say let's get rid of this whole base building phase and just make it year round maintenance. And then you ramp up only for a few weeks and you don't have time to burn out and say cripes because it's just what you do. It's just how you live. This is, we make it a lifestyle and it's a heart healthy lifestyle the way that I'm going to ask you to do it. Um, and it's the, the, like, there's no limit to what you can do, but if you go too hard, you cut this too short, you do all of this too hard, you burn out, you finish, you're unsatisfied with the result, and then you're gonna walk away and try to find another hobby or another habit. And I get that, that psychologically it makes sense, but it's a, it's a cycle and uh, that's of negativity that I would like to help people break. So, totally, the best shape of my life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, hell yeah, you're in great shape, Susan. More so than you think you are. Well, there's a lot that's on the internet, some of it's bad advice. But it's clickbait, right? So people are writing what you're going to respond to. They're, you have more control as a consumer now than you've ever had in the past. Um, if you, you say to coaches, I want a three-day-a-week marathon training plan, they're going to write it. You will find somebody who will write it. Most of us won't because that's stupid. A three-day-a-week marathon training plan for 12 weeks? No, it's not enough running. I don't care who you are. Um, but I, especially if you're coming to me for it, I do know who you are. I know the demographic that, that gravitates towards me very well. It is rare that I get an outlier because um, it's not a question of fitness. I'm fit enough that I should be able to do this three days a week. Okay, great. Go find someone that agrees with that. It's not because I, I would argue for the marathon, it is not about your fitness level. But, uh, but back to this, all training plans follow this pattern and have these, these three segments. So the, here's what we usually don't say about the base phase. So it's for getting back into the pattern of running five days a week the way I want you to, six days a week if you're here for performance, the aerobic cleanup, getting your cardiovascular system back in check, and getting your tendons, joints, and ligaments adapted to the work that it's going to do when the intensity ramps up. Because I tell you what, if your ankles are hurting after a long run in week three, they're going to be killing you when we start doing the harder effort workouts on things like the outstanding and super outstanding plans on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Okay, so it's not going to get better. It's just the work is just going to change. And the hard will be at a different location than it was before because we're moving the training stimulus around. 
Easy will always be easy. Hard will always be hard. Just like when I figure out when some when a hard element has then become easy, either I I, I I change it around. Either I make it faster, I make it I make the interval longer, I take away the rest, I play with it in some way to bring out a better result in you. But and then the third thing is strength. Most people do not have a habit of strength throughout the year. They just don't. I might have a few people that are like you know, serial CrossFitters, those people do, their flip side is they don't have a good running habit because CrossFit is big, big time suck. Orange Theory, also, they get out of their running habit, they drop the long run. It's a big, big time suck to do Orange Theory because the way most people, and this is not a criticism, it's just a fact. The, you are encouraged to do CrossFit and Orange Theory between three and four days per week, which is exactly what I tell you to do, right? We want strength three, ideally four days a week. and But those classes are 45 to 50 minutes long. So by the time you've gotten there, done the workout, shower, change, you don't have time to do a run before you go to work too. So it becomes binary. Either I CrossFit or I'm a runner. So the name of the game for those people is to make sure there's enough to actually maintain in a way that would allow us to ramp back up without making them miserable and hate running when they get to the train when they get to the end of the training cycle and they're like, I don't that didn't feel good. I made all these sacrifices. I walked away from Orange Theory. I lost all my friends. I lost my spot in the 5:30 a.m. class. I'm on the wait list again. I'm back to like 10 pounds for bicep curls. I was up to 22. I've lost all this fitness and it wasn't worth it. And of course it isn't worth it. It would never be worth it. If that's what you're putting on the training plan and on me, nothing's ever going to be worth it. You got to do this because you want it. You, you like it. What's it worth is a question. It's a dialogue I'm happy to engage in. But if it wasn't worth it, I'm, you know, I'm going to say that maybe the framework you were using to evaluate that result or the expectations you had coming in were a little farcical. But so from here, so strength is something we need to have year round in some form or fashion. Because the other thing you might not be doing in huge amounts, because it's not super sexy and super competitive, is a lot of proprioceptive work, a lot of balance work. No barefoot work ever, because legally, you're not legally allowed to be around heavy things in a gym and be barefoot. Um, so as, you, as I found out the hard way. But so but ideally, by week 12, and I know Susan, you've heard me say this more than, more than pretty much anyone else has. But by the end of this base phase, you are actually ready to cover the marathon distance. Not the way that you would want to. You're not ready to perform, but you are fit enough and we've ramped you up enough that I could send you out, arguably, to cover 26.2 miles and you could physically do it without needing to stop. I mean, if we executed a race plan, this is why it's like... The race plan matters and the strategy matter. Knowing how to run a marathon is just as important as being fit enough to run a marathon, right? Because I ran 20 miles and felt fine until I hit a wall. I would argue that's an execution problem. That's not knowing how to execute the marathon versus being fit enough to participate in the marathon. But I digress. What I'm looking for are all the markers that are going to tell me if I'm in, in your training peaks that you are prepared to cover 26.2 miles in one sitting regardless of how long that takes. Okay, and by week 12, if you've been doing all the things, most people are. If you've been doing 80% of all the things, meaning you have done accelerators when you've thought about it, you've definitely done all the running, maybe you've missed one or two here and there, you've done one round of strength at least once a week, you're ready to cover the distance. But this all, and I, like I said in the previous, on my Facebook Live yesterday, the strength and the drills and all that other stuff makes the rest of this easier. It's like a cushion. So if you want to throw that cushion away, that's on you. But you find out what that cushion's for when we get here, and it's easier than you expected. But not to go, so by week 12, we are ready to cover the distance. So by week 5, in my 20-week plans, my unspoken goal is that by week 5, we have ramped your, your training for the week to roughly the equivalent of your target race mileage. With this, so think about any training plan you've ever done, if you've done a 16 or 12 week marathon training plan, by week five, you should be covering at least 26 miles in your week. Because most of those plans are written in miles, not written in minutes. I write my plans differently, right? We write them in minutes, and therefore we're not gonna be getting the miles out. But when you look at the math that most coaches are doing, especially Hal Higdon, and it's not disrespectful, it just is what it is. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but by week five, you're covering 26.2 miles. And from there, it only increases. 
think about it. A lot of the advanced training plans are done by mileage, right? So it's whether or not you do six six miles on a Wednesday or ten miles on a Wednesday with except with speed elements like two hundreds and eight hundreds thrown in. One of my favorites is a 1200-800 combo. That's a really great marathon um, marathon prep session, but that's considered pretty advanced because if if you haven't been running for a really long time, if you weren't on a track team, it is not natural to think in terms of 1200. What is a 1200? It's three laps around uh, around the track in lane one, right? But that's three quarters of a mile. Three quarters of a mile is not how most of us are programmed unless we ran track at one point or another. But again, I digress. Sorry to go off on a tangent there. But so week five, we're, your, your weekly mileage, I'm hoping for most of my clients, your weekly mileage is going to come somewhere close to your target race distance, whether we're talking about a 5K or whether this plan that we're doing is it for a 5K or for a marathon or an, even an ultra marathon. I want by week five, I want us to be coming pretty close. So you saw like in the, the, in the, the stream that I did yesterday, I talked about Julie is in week five of her ultra, uh, sorry, she's not, she's three. I think we're, we're in, we're midway through week three, right, Susan? Um, of her, um, uh, is there lifting involved somewhere in your plan? A strength, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, I have a lot of strength, but no, no specific lifting. I'm not a strength coach, I don't wanna be. I will talk through the foundations of strength that is, that is required for runners. And I'm not saying weights are bad. I'm saying we can do a whole lot with body weight and I'd rather max that out before sending someone out to pick up um, uh, a resistance weight. So, and also once they get there, I would rather they hire a, uh, a dedicated strength coach for that that can watch their form because what I can do online is very, very limited in a virtual training cycle. And that, when you're really working with with resistance weights, you need to be dialing that in continually as you go. And I tell everyone to seek out a strength coach for that. But so anyway, but as I was saying, Julie last week is uh, Julie's training for 50 miles. Last week would have been week three. And her weekly total, I think, was 10 and a half hours. And that worked out to be 42 and a half or 43 miles. So by week five, we'll be covering 50. Um, so she's right on target. Susan's right on target. Everybody's right on target. But if you think about that week five, we're getting up. Your weekly total should be somewhere in the vicinity of your, um, your, your target race mile, the, the, the total mileage of your target race. By week 10, the unspoken goal is that your long run sandwich, it's just the sandwich, is equal or greater than the race distance. And the long run sandwich for my, um, for my, you know, 50 fucking milers is a three day sandwich. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and for everyone else base, it's pretty much just Friday, Saturday. So that two day sandwich should be getting close to 26 miles by week 10. Once we've gotten, so again, but this is how I say with, and that those two factors together is how I say with confidence, but is that by week 12, you are ready to cover the distance because we've been covering the distance. We've been covering the distance in, diff in two different ways. Then we get into what is usually referred to as the speed phase. I feel like this is a misnomer. The way that I look at it, it's not this, this is not this, the speedy phase. This is like first, I've said it consistently. First we cover the distance, then we hone for speed. Week 12, we've covered the distance. Now we can start adding in some of the harder workouts to make you faster and more efficient at covering that distance. And we have a very short time frame for this to sink in. So each, each workout you do, it takes two weeks for the benefits to present in your body, right? And it's not like I can work out and then two weeks later, yay, and do, I work out one on Monday, do nothing for two weeks, and then yay, benefits appear. It's like, it's a process. It's a cumulative process, like putting coins in a bank and letting in compounding interest. So this is where the two week taper comes from. It's that science of it takes two weeks for the benefit of a workout to present. So in these two weeks, at the end, all we need to do is preserve, we need to not get hurt, and we need to make sure that all of the sharpening work we've gotten to become a little faster and a little more efficient at this distance has sunk in and will be present. But there's no point in doing really hard stuff after that. So I like to think of this phase as the specific phase, okay? So we go from the generalized workouts and getting into the habit, and now you're ready to cover the distance, 
and now this is a bit of a specific push towards the race itself. If what we're training for is a, is a 10K, you're going to see a lot of 2K repeats um, with 800s thrown in at the end. You're going to see a lot of longer runs that just don't make sense to you at all, where you're like, why am I doing a three hour long run with one hour easy, one hour e at the beginning, one hour easy at the end, and then the middle hour is like eight um, eight 1K repeats followed by uh, four 800s and three 200s and four and two 100s. Why? And I'm like, because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to kick at a 10K. I'm going to get you real tired. Then we're going to practice kicking every single long run. And then we're going to have a long, long cool down an hour to let all of those benefits sink in. So th during this specific, you will never see a long run like that, by the way, in a marathon training plan. It does not benefit you in any way. So the specific phase is the type of speed that is specific to doing well at whatever you signed up for. For the marathon, we know that the best and most accurate preparation you can do are one mile repeats. But here's the trade-off and here's why this phase is always so short. You listening? One of the most dangerous workout you can do, the one that has broken the highest number of runners preparing for a marathon is one mile repeats. So it goes back to what, I was, what I've said, again, consistently all along. We can get a lot of strong and a lot of strength and a lot of faster with no risk. Once we get into the specific workouts, the track intervals, the one mile repeats, once we get into this phase, we're taking big risks and we need a big cushion, the biggest one possible before we can take risks. You guys like to think it's all about the, the magic workouts that I give you, but I'm like, no, it's about how prepared you are to execute these workouts that's gonna make the difference. If we do something before you're ready, you're gonna get hurt. And that is why the one mile repeat is really dangerous. That's my opinion, but there you go. Um, most people have jumped into elements that they really weren't ready to do. They hadn't been doing the strides, they hadn't been doing the strength, they hadn't been doing the high knees, they hadn't been doing the drills, they hadn't been doing anything anything and then they come in thinking oh but I'm, I'm i'm serious now because i'm those one mile repeats are the best i'm like but you aren't you haven't done the work to be ready for the one mile repeats so all they're, they're not going to make you faster they're going to hurt you but there that's my rant about that so from here in this phase we can improve your outcome if you've been doing all the things a lot of coaches particularly arthur lydiard he used to think of this as sharpening this is the phase we got ready for the race and now we're sharpening to be to bring up the best and be, to make sure that we're peaking on race day. So the way we do that, whenever you're training, like think of it in, in a weight room because this is the experience most people have before they come to me, right? If you've been, if you've ever lifted weights or known people who did, you start with say, I don't know, a deadlift and you're gonna deadlift 10 or 15 pounds and then and you're gonna do three sets of 10, okay? And then when that gets really easy and your trainer is gonna say something, all right, now let's, up the intensity and up the, you up the weight. You go from like 10 to 12 or 10 to 15, but that three by 10 never changes, right? So this is, you are, you're just gonna get heavier and heavier. It's not gonna get longer and longer. What we're doing here, if you think of it this way, during the, what I call the overtraining phase, this is the final push before, before you can get to the race. It's to, the, the general goal and why I call this, you know, the hell period, hell week, it's to overtrain you. It's to get the, the last bits we find that we possibly can, then let them sink in, let them disappear, and then race. And a lot of coaches do this. I do it. My, the way I encourage a taper depends on the event. It depends on the person. Like everyone doing three days at the fair or anyone that's trained with me for an ultra, you know that your taper is way shorter. The taper for my elites is way shorter. They're, what they do is way different, but my elite marathoners, you know, if I send them out for a three hour run, they're going to be running 34 miles um, at easy effort. So because that's how efficient they are. So we have to change the stimulus depending on the efficiency. We have to try harder to get the same net benefits. So we have the base period, the specificity period, the specific workouts, which is the risk injury period, then the definite overtraining period. Um, and that makes you appreciate the taper a little bit. This first week taper, you're real happy for it. The second week, you're just like ready to race. So that is this when, so back to the original question, what prompted me to be here today, people were asking me what elements do I need to see in a training plan? This, but I tell you every training plan has it. 
you're not going to see a lot of training plans unless they're ridiculous. Like they're like, and, and, and I laugh about the three, the three week, three days a week running training, marathon training plan for 12 weeks because, um, in one of my coaching, uh, listservs, um, the, a reporter contacted a whole bunch of us offering us money for a very well-known running publication. Again, we get, we all get this call once a year asking for that training plan because that's what their readers want. And I'm like, no, none of us would agree to write it. But yet somehow it gets published every year. They find someone to do it. Um, but it's never people in our community because they'd be ostracized if they, if their name came up in the byline, we're all watching, um, because it's unethical. But there you go. That is, this is the anatomy of a training plan. These are the elements. You want these three phases. You want something that's going to um, get you into the habit, that's going to you know, first prepare you to cover the distance, hone you to be more efficient at that distance, and then overtrain you a little bit and make sure that there's enough room for a taper. That is it. I prefer the plans that also include a lot of strength and a lot of drills because they're good for you and they're good to do. Um, but a lot of people and a lot of coaches are in this to earn a living. I do it for fun for now um, and pro always will. Even when I open fitness protection, I'm not going to be catering to your tastes. I mean, to, I will to a certain degree, but I'm not going to be writing a three-day-a-week, 12-week-long marathon training plan just because you want it. I'm going to be giving you – I'm going to be still doing my MK thing. Like, this is what I do. This is how I do. This is why I do. You can take it or leave it. Um, but – if you're looking for if you you know you're looking for a plan now and you're not ready hi why hello Sarah hello um, yeah so if you you know if you can't wait for me to come back to coaching that's that's cool I get it um, the meeting yesterday went better than I expected and I'm we got two more to go but I'm very hopeful that you'll see me soon I'm gonna leave it there because I don't anything more than that um, during Mercury and retrograde I'm gonna jinx it but for now if you're already looking ahead and you're already a little nervous and you're already like, I don't know what to do. Okay. What you need to do is be running. You need to be running in the same pattern that your training plan will follow. The sooner we can get into that habit and start that lifestyle, the better. Um, if you have any plan I've ever written, go ahead and start at week one. If you want to, if you're further ahead than that, start wherever makes sense. Um, I'm always happy to, to discuss it with you guys. But um, I will I will say this: the e it will the easier it will be to switch things around and kick things into higher gear later, the sooner you start. If you're already if you're already running like so so all of my plans follow the same pattern: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off, uh, or Thursday optional. Um, Friday um, Friday Friday Saturday run sandwich. Sunday mandatory rest day. So all of my plans follow that pattern. Knowing that. If you can go ahead and start imitating that pattern and reworking your schedule around that pattern, if you think you're going to want to use me or one of my plans, now is a really good time to start moving back that way. Um, or if you think you're going to use a Hal Higdon plan, I think his are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off, Saturday long run, Sunday off. Go ahead and get into that habit. Whatever your future training plan is going to look like, start imitating it today. And by the time you get there and you have to have it turned on, then that takes the pressure off of everything in the, in the, in the base building phase because you've already had the habit and you can focus on doing the things you hadn't been doing. Like, all right, all right, now we're here. I'm going to get serious about strength. Now we're here. I'm going to get serious about warm up drills. Now we're here. I'm going to get serious about foam rolling. Whatever that thing is you aren't doing, instead of like, here are all 10 things I have not been doing and I now have to adapt to all 10 of them in a 12 week period if you're not on one of my plans it's probably an eight week period. So there's that. Um, because no one ever wants to cut this short, right? What gets cut short is this. And then when this is shorter, the pressure's on because we can't cut the taper. We can't cut the push. We can't really extend this. So it's this, this base building, pattern building, adaptation cycle that people are like, I'm she think I'm 12 weeks. She thinks I'm fast. She don't, you don't know me, Coach MK. I'm like, you're right. I don't, and I don't need to. I know me. And I've been doing this for 30 fucking years. And if after 30 fucking years, I get scared, think someone who has not taken an extended break willingly from running, if I think 12 weeks is such a short period, it makes me nervous, then I get nervous for anyone that finds the fact that I've been running this way for 30 years really hard to believe. That is it. That's all I have to say about an anatomy of training plan. I'm going to go back through and look at the comments. If y'all have questions, now is a good time to throw them in there.
you are in terrific shape, Susan. It's crazy. Is there lifting involved in your plan? I mean, I don't write the lifting in. I think I said that earlier, but I'm always happy to work with people who were lifting before they decided to put their name in the hat for the New York City Lottery um, or any other marathon. So just, you know, I will work with, with you wherever you're at, but we probably need to talk it out and make sure that you're choosing the right plan because everyone opts into harder, right? Everyone will look at the at three plans and be like, I'm advanced. <laughs> I'm intermediate and that's fine but I would argue if you're lifting four days a week and you're quite competitive about it um, let's say if you're trying to go for um, a PR in in the deadlift we probably really don't need to be on an advanced training plan with super hard intensity elements that are going to stress your back out because some of that really hard running and pounding on concrete or on the road like we're gonna have to do to get you ready for a road race sorry you can't race on a trail in New York City um, then that that pounding combined with the, the stress on your back from the deadlift, it's gonna be a really bad combination for your spine in the long run. So I would wanna talk about that. Is it possible to PR during a training cycle, PR in the deadlift in a training cycle? Absolutely, if we do it carefully. If we're not carefully, if we're just like more, more, more in all aspects with no regard for balance, that's a really great way to get hurt and that's the opposite of what I see my job is. Um, 50 was a mental game changer for me. Yeah, because I'd been telling you you're ready to cover the distance. You didn't believe it, Susan. And no one believed it. Why would you? But it's like I tell everyone that we, when we get here, I'm like, you're ready to cover the distance. If I sent you out and you had to do it, if I dropped you off, you know, 50K from your house and said the only way to get home is to run, you could do it. You wouldn't love it. It wouldn't be the way you wanted to do it. It wouldn't be the finish time you would want. But if you had to do it, you could. And that is why... Um, when we started all this, I knew you guys were going to go on to go down and see Julie, and I would not have given her permission to do Rocky Raccoon if I didn't think that both you and Kate would have been fit enough to yellow it with her. Y'all got lucky that the math worked out, because if it had been week eight, I would have been like, can we not do the 50K? How about you just crew? And I know it wouldn't have been worth it to you or the expense or the cost to go and just crew for Julie, you can, and, 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 I, and I get that, I get that. I get money and conversations and it's a zero sum game in a household, I get it. Um, but you know, the math worked out that it was right, right where it needed to be, where you were ready to cover the distance. So that was just kind of magic, but that's the magic I don't tell you about because if I did, it kind of ruins it when things work or it gives you something else to spin out about, like all the emails I've been getting about, my efficiency factor isn't moving and I'm like, oh shit, that's exactly what I said to do not from you guys specifically but from other people um kim i've not been doing pickups or accelerators because i'm nursing an it band injury um i mean he the, here's the thing about pickups and accelerators pickups um make you more aerobically efficient they're a good way to um up the ante uh, of your fitness and boost your metabolism without stressing your system or the or putting a lot of stress on the big muscle groups without you know inducing a lot of the cumulative fatigue that would cause you to overtrain faster. So they're a super efficient way to stick to stick that in. If you haven't been doing pickups, like that is fine. Here's the thing, I can't tell you that the net result, doing all of the things, or not doing all the things, will be exactly the same as doing all of the things. What I can say is you're injured. You've got a pretty big injury. Um, what's going to make the difference on race day is how healed your injury is. That is your limiting factor, not your mental fortitude, not your training, not whether or not you've done pickups. It's like, am I hurt or am I not? Um, so you, I really wouldn't worry about it. Worry about recovering, worrying about doing the work required to get that IT band to calm down, whatever your PT's told you to do. And I know this has been ongoing for a long time and I'm really sorry. I know, I, again, I'm with you. I know how frustrating it is and I wish... I could see you, I could touch you, I could work with you, I could go with you some of these places and help you get better answers um, than what I think you've been getting. But it's not that I don't I think anyone's been doing anything wrong, it's just the nature of an injury. Um, it's, it's long and it's frustrating and it's heartbreaking and I'm really sorry. So rather than looking back over this training cycle and thinking I did something wrong because I didn't do X, Y, and Z, I want you to be like, I trained for this and I did it despite the fact that I had a motherfucking serious IT band thing going on. Normal humans would have stopped I did not, yay me, right? That's how you've got to look at it, except finish time is never going to reflect what you didn't do. It's going to reflect the fact that you did it with, despite, in spite of, an injury. 
an injury that would have stopped most people from running at all. Or rather, would have stopped a lot of people in their tracks and saying, like, I'm not meant to be a runner. I don't have the genes. Jesus doesn't love me. Jesus gave these genes to all these other people, but not to me. And why, God, why not me? And it's just, that's the way people think. It's easier to think I just don't have it than it is I could get it. So I don't think I'm particularly gifted or athletic. This is just... And I certainly don't think I'm lucky that my dad had a heart attack that impoverished my family when I was six years old and I had to grow up in a cardio rehab clinic. So yay, 30 years later, the silver lining to all of that is that I have a really good habit that I understand in a different, in a different perspective on it than most other coaches I meet because I've, I, my experience in the running world has been through a completely different lens. Um, and we, it's almost like we speak a different language. I can't even sit on a panel and sit in the same room with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these coaches when they talk because our viewpoints are just so different and our demographics are so different. Um, so I mean, like I'm, I'm grateful and will always be grateful that I've been able to parlay those, those experiences into something positive. Um, but at, at the same time, it's not like, yay me, this is amazing. I, I wouldn't wish a heart attack on, you know, the parent of any child. So there's that, but it's easier for a lot of people to be like, woe is me, I don't have it and walk away than to say, hey, this is good. I like this. I'm happy, like Malcolm Gladwell said, it's, fu it's fun to be a mediocre runner. I don't need to be out there planning to win the marathon. So I'll stop there. But yeah, you're, I think you're going to be, as long as you're not injured, you're going to be fine. It's going to come down to the injury, not whether or not you've, you have done pickups or accelerators this training cycle, Kim. Um, one mile repeats. Yeah, one mile repeats are terrible. I hate them. I hate them. Um, to give you a perspective on how fast they are, my one mile repeats when I was training for an 838, sorry, an eight, um, 830 pace, 335 marathon, um, back in 2016, my one mile repeats were at a little, just a tick, like my 12K pace, just a tick slower than my 10K pace, right? So I was running them at 745. That, that for me, my easy effort pace was like a 1030. So I was running... Like, yeah, those were, for me, they were, those were hellishly fast. Um, but that is what, that's what you have to do to get ready for a faster marathon. And that's what the speed phase looks like um, in a more advanced training plan. So I just haven't signed up for any races yet. I used to be a field girl on college track. Should I start with 5Ks? Up to you. I, I hate 5Ks. To run a 5K properly, you have to run so hard. Most people don't race a 5K properly. Let's start there. They don't they don't max themselves out in a 5K. I would start with the 10K because 10K seems to be that thing everyone nails. Like if I were to take any runner and like lay their PR and lay their PRs out, like before we can work together, I need you to go race a, a, a 5K, race a 10K, race a half, and that will take you about three months. So once that is done, call me and give me all three of those numbers. And I used to do that. And when people would, I'd be like. Okay, so your 5K pace is a 10 minute mile, and your 10K pace is a 10.15, and your half marathon pace is a 10.20. There's something off. And usually what I would come to find was that their 5K pace, they hadn't been run it fast enough, um, and that the, the 10K pace was dead on. So that is why I would also say start with the 10K. If you are a lifter, a 10K is a much more, it's much easier to grasp because once you get into the speed phase, you're not going to be doing anything so hard or so jarring that it could interfere with other work you're doing in the weight room. So that's what I, that's what I would do. Um, the base running to work up to a 5k. So the base running work up to a 5k, I had a program that I called Heart Rate 101 and it was an introductory um, running program for people that were new, not just to training with heart rate, but training my way with heart rate. Uh, Cause again, my way with heart rate is very different than what everybody else does. It's a lot cleaner and more simple um, because I don't want to do math with people all day long. I hate, I mean, as much as I love math, I have an MBA from Wharton. I was an informant, I'm a former investment banker. I do spreadsheets for fun. I like math, I like data, and I will have these conversations with people problem is a lot of people um, don't they use good data and make bad decisions so I've discovered in this area where people might not be aware of my background they just see as a coach and they're like I'm gonna out math you and it becomes like an arm wrestling game and I'm like no you're not 
this is terrible logic you're using and kind of sad and you're wasting my time and you're wasting your time and you're not paying me to engage with you on this level. So I came up with a very scaled, slimmed down version of the, the best practices I'd seen. So I have one rule, anything over 140, you will never convince me that was an easy effort, period. So that's what makes it easy. So I digress, so I have a lot of, um, um, there's nothing really freely available at the moment, but there, there will be once um, the fitness protection program, op go, uh, the site opens up. And I don't know when that's gonna be yet, guys. I'll I promise you will know when I do. I got two more meetings to go with my kid. Susan is a freaking boss. I'm too. Susan's amazing. Um, commitment. Commitment is your superpower, Susan. But, well, see, think about it too, Susan. Think about how from the the reason I agreed to do this, even though it's got me in you know trouble. Like, why did you take this on and make it private? Um, you are so excited about it. I like that type of excitement only leads to good places. Most people sign up for a marathon not feeling as excited about that event or getting ready for that event or doing that event as you did the first day you said, hey, I found a, an ultra I think I can train for in my urban New Jersey home. Um, and so that's why I think it's not that you know your willpower is higher or your commitment level is better, it's that you're excited. You picked something that made sense, that ideologically appealed to you, that you were passionate about, that you were willing to do the work for, and had, realistically, and I told you how much work it was gonna be, and you were like, I've got space for that, and you have continued to live that and make space every day, and that is really what has made this different. It's that level of excitement. That's how excited I get to run the New York City Marathon, and that is why it was, when I was really depressed, coming back after my first baby, finding out immediately I'm already pregnant with my second, to make me feel better, my friends at New York Roadrunners, that I that I trained with when I lived there, they gave me an entry and they were like, I know you hate your life in Texas. I know that this whole not having a career thing, being a stay at home mom, that is not what you intended because it was a beautiful accident. Come back for a weekend, see if you can make it a five day weekend and we'll take the days off of work and we'll do all the things that you loved in New York and we're gonna make you feel better. And that was my first step towards better. And so when I think about, and after every baby I've had since, they've given me a free entry to come back and do that same thing over and over again. And uh, we're all older and they have, most of them are married now and have families of their own. So we, you know, a five day weekend isn't possible and taking, taking more off from work isn't possible anymore. But whenever I think about the New York City Marathon, I get as excited as you do about running three days at the fair. So not, not to be like, you lack commitment, you don't. I'm not trying to argue with you there. What I'm trying to say is it's not that you in and of yourself are a special unicorn in the way that you think you are. The what's unicorn about you is that you're doing the thing I tell everyone to do, which is find something you're excited about, that you give a shit about, and that is what's gonna make you committed. Not like, I put all this money down, I'm hiring a coach, so since I made this huge investment, I'm gonna get my money's worth, and because that's pressure, and I need pressure to perform, and that never goes anywhere good. I will never earn your money, and um, my effort will never be worth your time, because you're not gonna get what you want on race day, and you're gonna, because you don't know what you want on race day. Right, it's gonna be, and whenever whenever you get it, you're gonna wish it was something different. And that's an impossible standard for you to live up to or for me to try to, to play to, so I don't play. So, and that's why people like to think I'm lazy, and I'm like, you are right, I'm lazy, run away. It's so fast for me, it's fast for most. 10Ks are so hard, they're terrible, I hate 10Ks. But the 10K distance, if you're not a runner, is a good place to start, because that effort, what most people think, that, like, that's as hard as I can go, that's as fast as I can go, I don't want to go any faster than that, that ends up being their 10K race pace. People have a pretty good feel instinctively for 10K pace. It's trying to push people to grab and hold on to anything faster than that that's really, really hard. And that was the failure, I think, in the first six months of the monthlies that, I, that we released in 2017. Um, the hard was too hard. I was trying to teach everyone the gears that exist above 10K pace, and people were like, this hurts. I don't like it, F that. Um, and I thought, well, it's the winter time. Most people, their people are in between training cycles. They'll have no trouble going indoors to do this ridiculously fast pace, set it, and then just try to follow it and find it with the, the assistance of a treadmill. And all my assumptions fell apart. So <laughs> when we got into 2018, um, I ramped the monthlies back big time. I was like, okay, we're just gonna really get used to three gears, half marathon, 10K, 5K, half marathon, 10K, 5K, and we're gonna leave it there. And that worked out a whole lot better. 
um, because 5K pace is hard. Anything faster than that is fucking hard. Anything faster than that to do and keep going, most people just don't want to do, and that's okay. So that was the uh, that was the the idea behind that was the change and the, a learning curve for me um, doing the monthly plans from 2017 and what changed in 2018. Bye, Suze. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, January 2018 was brutal, and that was the change came in February. The feedback I got from January was so bad. I was like, if I really want to grow this, I am gonna have to dial it, but dial it back a little bit because this is so fast. It's not fun for people. So, um, training on a treadmill. If you are training for anything where you kind of care about the output, the treadmill is a tool, and you better fucking embrace it. That's that's what I think about a treadmill. Um, if you have the option to go outside, exercise it but cautiously. It's icy outside right now. So I'm going to be doing my run. I only have 30 minutes today. I'm going to be doing that this afternoon when the ice, we had an ice storm around four in the morning and little ice pellets are all over the ground when I walk the kids to school. I'm like, I could put on my cleats and run in this, or it's going to be 40 degrees today. All this shit's going to be melted by three in the afternoon when the sitter, when the sitter comes back, I'm going to get dressed. I've got an alarm going off in my, um, in my calendar. It's going to tell me to go upstairs and get dressed. Um, and when I get, and then I'm going to get dressed and go out the door as soon as the sitter walks in, do my 30 minutes, come back, throw my wet clothes off. And then, cause it's 40 degrees, I'll probably overdress and be too hot and then go pick up my kids from, from, from school. So that is how my day is going to roll. And if you don't have that type of flexibility in your schedule and then you can wake up and you look outside and there's ice on the ground and you're like, I don't know about this cause that mobile ice is dangerous ice. Um, that's when the treadmill seems like a really good idea and it's a and it's something it's a it's not bad and it's not less than I mean it's not perfect but perfect is the enemy of the good and if we're in a training cycle get on the fucking treadmill you know what the fucking treadmill is better than falling on the ice and breaking a fibula and I've got two runners with broken fibula, fibulas right now one of whom is my blind runner uh, that uh, Carrie that I've been running with uh, for the past three weeks you won't see him in my Strava anytime soon because he broke a fibula going on a run with his dog poor dog you didn't love January it felt so accomplished I'm sorry I'm sorry but yeah like I said I've learned and I've backed right off and um, anything you see in fitness protection going forward will have an option for people that want to race shorter distances and get faster they're gonna have to play with those levers right if you want to do if you want to run a fast 5k you're gonna have to get used to 1k pace and that's not great. So, but I'm going to have a couple of different flavors and I'll do some surveys before we open for business um, and make sure, because I don't want to be creating five different training plans every month if people are realistically only buying one or two. So there's that. But yay, you're welcome for all the advice. Thank you for coming and hanging out. If nobody else has any more questions, I'm going to go because it's been almost an hour. We're down to five viewers and uh, this is pretty much all I have to say on this. I think my next thing I'm going to come back and talk about is the elements of speed, what they are, when to use them, and how to break them down. Because the other question, all the what was packed into all the questions that I got overnight. And again, you can always email questions to info at coachandlove.com if you don't mind me streaming the answer. Because um, I love doing this, by the way. I really do. I love answering questions. I love talking about this. I love talking it out. Um, and yeah, the next thing I want to do is break down speed because almost all of the questions I got about how do I choose a training plan? I've got this, this, and this, which offers this element, this element, and this element, which element is the best element for the marathon, for me, for this course, for whatever. Um, and they were really convoluted questions and I know that they mean well, but if you're, if this is, if you were comparing training plans based off of this six week period, I'd say that's the wrong question, that's the wrong place to start. Hopefully I've given you a better way to look at it and a better place to start. But when I do come back um, and do a talk, I think the next one I'm gonna do is about the elements of speed, what and when, and I think of it like a jigsaw puzzle and putting the pieces together, um, kind of like a like Jenga style, right? If you put If you put something, if you don't have a firm foundation, the top's gonna fall right over it. And what does that look like? So, okay. Um, I feel you. Knowing where to start is the hard place. The hardest, the, where I tell everyone to start is get ready to move for 30 minutes Monday through Friday. 30 minutes of, and when you run, embrace the idea of jogging. You gotta, you know, you gotta crawl before you can walk. You gotta walk before you can run. And jogging's great. Jogging, 
over time is what makes you faster at running in a race situation. So I jog five days a week and I'm, I'm good with that. But that anything under 140 is jogging. Somehow jogging has become this nasty loaded word. And I think that's stupid. Fuck yeah, I jog. I jog for heart health. I jog, jog for longevity. It's why I've been running for 30 years and don't have terrible knees and a fucked up back. Um, my fucked up back comes from having four babies in a really short period of time. Not from the running, but I digress. So there. Um, thank you, Sarah. Yes, I have a, I do I have a podcast. I have a whole website, www.coachedandlove.com. You can check that out too. Um, and I have a blog where I talk about my training and the training of others. I'm migrating slowly all of the pieces that I wrote for my private clients over the past five years into the blog. So every day when you come back, there'll be more old articles. Um, but anyway, that's, I've already gone five minutes longer than I said I was going to. You are coached. You are loved. Let's go in at Thursday. And I really hope that you guys don't have this virus that all my kids are having. The school is calling me right now and I bet that's Cheyenne about to go down. Happy birthday to my husband and happy anniversary to us. This week we get to spend it with the tummy virus. We.